Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Invest Africa. I'm Alicia Sekum. Well, despite constrained political conditions, its small population, abundant natural resources and considerable foreign support have helped make it one of the more prosperous and stable countries in Africa. This week we take a closer look at Gabon to explore both the opportunities and the challenges that this Central African country presents. Bordering the Atlantic Ocean at the equator, between the Republic of Congo and Equatorial Guinea, Gabon spans close to 270,000 square kilometers and is home to roughly 1.6 million people. Gabon enjoys a per capita income four times that of most sub-Saharan African nations, but because of high income inequality, a large proportion of the population remains poor. Human development indicators remain below the average for middle-income countries, with unemployment currently standing at 30% for young people, which is much higher than the national average of 16%. Until the offshore discovery of oil in the 1970s, Gabon was reliant mainly on timber and manganese as revenue generators. But since the discovery of oil has dominated the economy, which contributes for about 50% of GDP, approximately 60% of revenues and 75% of export goods. Other export goods include uranium, to which it exports mainly to the USA, Australia and Malaysia. Import partners include France, China and the USA, from which it sources machinery, food products and chemicals. In 2011, GDP grew by an estimated 5.8%, which was down slightly from the 2010 figure of 6.6%. But overall, the economic activity has been boosted by extra public investment in building and improving roads and stadiums in preparations for the 2012 Africa Cup of Nations, which was hosted by Equatorial Guinea and Gabon. Economic activity is predicted to grow over the next two years, which will be dependent on a strong performance by export of raw materials and a significant recovery in domestic production. However, growth will slow slightly to 4.4% in 2012 and 3.3% in 2013. Allegations of electoral fraud during local elections in 2002 to 2003 and the presidential elections in 2005 exposed the weaknesses of formal political structures in Gabon. Following President Bongo's death in 2009, new elections brought Ali Ben Bongo, son of the former president, to power. President Bongo has made efforts to increase transparency and is taking steps to make Gabon a more attractive investment destination by diversifying the economy and increasing government investment in human resources and infrastructure. Well, joining us in studio now to take a closer look at Gabon as a business and investment destination is Abel Myberg. He's head of the Africa desk at BDO, Sven Richter, head of Frontier Markets at Renaissance Capital. And joining us from our bureau in Gabon's capital of Libreville is Sanjay Day. He's country director of Abidjit. Thank you all for joining me this afternoon. And Abel, let's kick off things with you. I mean, that a brief overview of what we're looking at with regards to Gabon and uh, getting some attention is President Bongo's efforts in increasing transparency, making Gabon a more attractive investment destination. In a broad sense, what for you is the investment case that Gabon puts on the table? Look, looking at um, several scenarios that it's currently applicable to Africa is almost in the same, the same instance applicable to Gabon as well, where there needs to be a di diversification of the, of the economy, not to be too... Um, Dependent on, on, dependent on, on the, the oil industry itself. Uh, therefore, you'll have a, a big drive towards uh, employment, trying to get that uh, up to, to the same pause as the introduction also showed. You know, there, there's a quite a large uh, percentage of, of the population unemployed, which is almost the same as, as the same of Africa itself. And, um, and obviously try to, to, to exploit some of the other industries. Mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, in terms of Gabon, you know, the transparency is, 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 is great, you know, because that's what we need, the positive news about countries in Africa, and then they're going towards the right direction. Absolutely. Obviously, the, obviously also the, the, the big involvement of the president himself in terms of, of new projects, contracts signed for, for the country. Yeah, we'll be taking a closer look at uh, the diversification we're seeing in the economy a little later on in the show. For now, Sanjay, uh, just taking a look at uh, you know the, the, what's been outlined, its ambitions and goals that have been set. How would you rate uh, you know the fundamentals of government and governance from your on-the-ground experience on that end? Well, Alicia, thank you for uh, inviting on the show and. Uh 
Well, uh, I've been uh, driving this initially for the uh, last one and a half year in Gabon and uh, the experience has been pretty exciting over here, especially with the fact that uh, the transparency of the government and the government functionaries has been excellent. Uh, the, the, the proactive approach that has been taken by everybody concerned you know, with the de development program of Emergent Gabon, they have been uh, very proactive in assisting uh, the group in terms of uh, providing the required knowledge base and the information that is initially required by a new investor into the country. So I would, uh, I would rate uh, Gabon very highly as far as uh, providing information to investors is concerned. Sven, I asked the question because yes, we've got multinationals queuing up to do business in Gabon, but questions have been raised about the validity of President Bongo's uh, rule, and that puts political risk in the forefront yet again. I mean, it can't be ignored, even if you've got economic activity or economic uh, growth predicted to be 4.4% in 2012, 3.3% in 2013, which is enviable on a, a relative basis, but political risk is often a big deterrent? Well, political risk is a deterrent. The thing is that Gabon sits in a very interesting position right now. They have this money from oil, but that's going to be ending fairly shortly. So they have to do something to replace it. Mm -hmm. And it looks like the president has really put a lot of initiatives and really is pushing these initiatives to do something about it. Now, I think for me, the biggest um, sort of thing about that was when one shopkeeper was interviewed in Gabon and he said, well, we'll just have to wait and see. Okay, We don't know yet whether the president is going to do a good job or a bad job. And I think that's where Gabon finds it itself at the moment. And in terms of political risk, I think that investors, we sit in a similar position. On the one hand, you have a president who looks like he's doing a good job. Um, he's really pushing, but he has a, a danger in that if the oil revenue dries up without him replacing it, there's going to be pressures on him and you're going to find the opposition gaining ground. On the other hand, if he's able to achieve what he does, I think people will be happy with him and he will gain credibility mm -hmm. by doing his job well. Um, yes, there is sort of, I suppose, almost um, um, the, the positive side is they move to a benevolent dictatorship there, which is sort of a, a bit like what Singapore had for many, many years. And that's what they're trying to follow, the model that they're trying to follow there. Um, so there are challenges, but there's also lots of opportunities. And as investors, we have to make an assessment as to what we see and what we can do yeah. for that. For what we're seeing now, uh, Sanjay, it really speaks to the ease of doing business in the country. I mean, we know that back in 2006, we had government reduce the size of cabinet in a centralization of power. And, you know, while that's a move that's been criticized, it's being said uh, that it's done to streamline operations, create efficiencies, and modernize the Gabonese state to lessen the red tape, the bureaucracy in the country. What's your experience as a businessman operating in that territory of the red tape that, that you do have to deal with? Absolutely, Alicia, I would, I would love to comment upon that, having been on the ground for quite some time now. And uh, what I can, uh, you know, uh, comment upon with all my heart is that that uh, red red tape is um, is at the at the bare minimum. I mean, I I, I haven't come across uh, any situation in Gabon when we are where we are completely lost in terms of information. Uh, uh, where we we uh, you know I have not come across any situation where there has been any over interference of the bureaucracy in any manner, and things has been absolutely very very simple and smooth for any foreign investor. And therefore, therefore, red, red tapeism is one thing, you know, uh, basically uh, with our group and me, myself coming from India and uh, seeing the situations over there and the complexity of doing business, uh, I, I, I feel Gabon is an excellent place in terms of uh, uh, there is no prevalence of any sort of red tapeism over here, absolutely. And added to that, Evo, we've got uh, quite a bit of incentive being put on the table as well. I mean, those involved in the timber industry, for example, investing in special economic zones. And I've got to read this because it's actually phenomenal. Enjoy a 10-year tax exemption from corporate tax, another five years at a 10% tax rate, no customs duty for 25% uh, uh, of uh, imported materials and the export of manufactured goods. They're exempt from that for 25 years as well, will receive a 50% discount on their electricity costs. I mean, looking at this, who won't want to do business in Gabon? <laughs> exactly. Uh, that's always interesting for me, you know, when, when you look at uh, countries as well, is to look at the incentives part of, part of business uh, that the government's offering. It always gives you a clear indication what, what industries are pushed by government and what are the flavors of the day. Wood industry, obviously, is a big demand for, for timber, especially in China, in, in terms of the railways. 
and, uh, and the building of bridges and support of, of, the, of the railway lines through Africa as well. And then they said, and the other, some of the other incentives that I looked at, you know, that was quite interesting is the, is the incentive on cement, because that's, that's, the, that's, that's the part of, of infrastructure development that, that's very needy in Africa, is the supply of cement. And there you also look at the similar, similar types of inve uh, incentives, you know, I mean, to, to offer a, a exemption on corporate tax sitting at 35%. That's, that's a good margin you can add to your profits, you know, so <laughs> definitely. A very good margin, <laughs> uh, you know, and as I say, a strong incentive being put on the table. I mean, Sven, for now, private capital is certainly responding, but is it sustainable? I mean, because often when the time comes for change, so whether it be 10 years yes. or 25 years down the line, that's when all the furore seems to set so in. It does happen, but look, has, has that worked? I read somewhere that the foreign direct investment that they have seen into that timber sector is equal to the foreign direct investment or more than the foreign direct investment that the country saw in the whole past 40 years. So they are doing something and I think that they realize that they are pressurized for time and they need to very quickly get other industries up and running. I mean historically before oil it was all manganese and timber as we were seen on, on the insert. So now it's got to do with getting the timber back up, doing the manganese, there are a couple of iron ore projects as well. And of course there's 10% of the country is a nature reserve. They're part of the Congo Basin. So they're busy building hotels all the time. I was reading they were flying Robert De Niro all over the, the country mm. to get him to be interested in building hotels. And he's saying, great place, we should build some hotels here. Yeah, well it's uh, all about leveraging off the opportunity as uh, quickly as you can, you know, getting a maximum or b bang for your buck, so to speak, Sanjay. How do you structure your business model and plan for that day, 10 years, 25 years down the line, is it clear enough that, uh, you know, this is the now and you're going to have to deal with the then, then? You know, basically our focus in Gabon is to set up a, a manganese processing plant and to support that manganese processing plant, we are going in for gas-based power. Uh, now, when you look at the manganese position here in Gabon, uh, excellent quality of manganese that, you know, in our Indian operations, we have been, we have been buying for the last 10 or uh, 12 or years. So we are absolutely sure about what is the quality and the grade of the manganese that is available. Uh, number two, being in the business for such a long time, we also have a pretty good idea about what is the size of the resources that is available and whether it is sustainable for the next 25, 30 years. So definitely what I see that uh, Abhijit is going to be operating on an even keel, you know, when you look at 25 years down the line. Now, uh, when you look at the, uh, the second issue that comes is, is uh, the power. Now, uh, number one is that, that this is gas-based power plant. So, uh, the, it is the cleanest fuel and therefore it is quite sustainable in terms of the environmental point of view, number one. Uh, number two, uh, the reserves of gas, we understand, are reasonable in order to sustain these kind of uh, projects. Number three, there are a lot of untapped hydropower potential in this area which is now being explored, including further explorations for uh, associated gas and natural gas. So therefore, therefore, 25 years down the line, I don't see uh, any challenges uh, that are likely to arise to RPG in terms of supply of these basic raw materials. Now, if you look at the business model, 100% of our products at this point in time and probably going ahead also would be exported. And there always remains a market internationally because we are not focused on the domestic market uh, uh, because of non-availability of further user of manganese. So the international uh, market is going to be alive, with, be it the Europe, be it the Americas, or be it China and uh, other Asian countries. So therefore, 25 years down the line, I, you know, we are absolutely clear that we will have the re resources to run these business, absolutely. Well, gentlemen, let's leave the conversation there for now. We're heading into a quick commercial break. More on Invest Africa when we return. Stay tuned.